Good morning, everyone. So this talk, I expected it to go two ways. Either it's quite full or almost no one is here because Kubernetes is always something either very interesting or very scary for people. So I'm happy to see that quite a lot of people chose to stop by. <laughs> so let me tell you a little bit about Kubernetes de deployments and actually what happens to them in the internet. So basically, we'll, we'll open up with a little intro. I'll serve you some basics of honeypots and Kubernetes. So all easy there. Introduce the honeypot and then talk a little bit about what you can do and what you can take away from this talk and the data I gathered. So you may ask yourself, who is this guy and what credentials has he? So I am Matthias Meidinger. I'm, I happen to work for Red Hat Advanced Cluster Security, which is part of OpenShift. So I know a thing or two about Kubernetes, you might say. And as, Red Hat and as Red Hat is an open source company, they recently also open sourced the upstream project, which is called Stackrocks, which is the open source mother project of ACS. And I, do, uh, I am the community manager together with a colleague of mine. So you might see me stick around at GitHub and as well as the regular community meetings and office hours. So for fun, I do photography, honeypots, and threat hunting, which might surprise you. But I also used to work at an AV industry, in the AV industry before. So I picked up honeypots there and found it super interesting. And I want to share a little bit my, my passion for them, because you can do really fun things with honeypots. So again, regarding the target audience, I don't expect you to know a lot about Kubernetes, because it is quite complex. And I know that it's a little bit of a scary topic. Regarding com uh, programming and honeypots, I don't expect any prior knowledge from you. So I'll, I'll get everyone up to speed. And that said, actually, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. So the people that know a little bit about IT security, as well as Kubernetes, might uh, recognize one or two best practices that I have, because they are, I guess, across our domain, almost univers universally um, yeah, you can, you can basically apply them universally. And that said, let's dive into the fun bits. So Kubernetes, really quick, just two slides. I'm not going to bore you. Uh, the thing is, let's start with meme, because at least for someone that has a little bit of fun. So nowadays, Kubernetes is running in a lot of places you might not even expect it. So even in socializing with other people uh, the last two days, I already learned a ton of new applications that I was surprised where Kubernetes is already running. So you keep hearing it. You keep seeing it. But what is it? So technically, nowadays, it is a platform. So at its core, it runs containers. And unlike Docker, it's, it's, it takes a little bit more of an automated approach. So it can scale, it can self-heal, and it can manage and do everything on a little bit of a different scale. And it actually does that for you as opposed to Docker, where you do almost everything by yourself. The modern Kubernetes is actually an ecosystem, which is there is not only the one Kubernetes. There is vanilla Kubernetes, but there is also things like cloud-specific ones, so Red Hat OpenShift, Amazon AWS, the, the whole Azure Cloud, GCP. You probably have, no, her, have heard of them by now. There is also on-prem variants, which, is, which are things like Red Hat OCP, or VMware Tanzu, or even SUSE Rancher. And then there is the, for me, most interesting thing for today, which is developer or edge Kubernetes. These are clusters that are basically very small and require not a lot of hardware to run. So they can run basically anywhere. And one of these examples is Minikube, which is originally, or was originally planned to be a bit of a developer or edge computing thing. So it's a single node. It's very small. It's very quick. And I decided to build a honeypot around that, with the idea being, hey, this is 
a little small honey for, uh, this is this little small Kubernetes instance that someone that doesn't know their thing exposes to the internet. So what would happen to that? So I keep saying that. So super quick, last slide, I promise, at least for Kubernetes, is Kubernetes is usually comprised of two big parts, which are the control plane, which hosts the API server, which does a lot of management stuff for you. And then you have multiple, one or multiple nodes that actually run the workloads. So this is these. What I have here is just a super small part of Kubernetes. So it's it's way bigger than that. But I'm only interested in these two parts, which is the API server, which you interact with with, for example, kube control, and the kubelet. The kubelet is what's running on your node. And what is actually looking, it basically it ensures that containers are running as you, are, as you have defined them. So it takes care of running the containers itself, which makes it a valuable target. Because actually, if you don't watch out, you can expose kube con the kubelet to the internet, which means basically anyone can play around with it if it's not configured correctly. So. <coughs> Basically, that's it for Kubernetes. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about honeypots, or pots for short, which is honeypots are a system intended to mimic likely attacks. Atta <coughs> they basically um, are basically they are looking like they are a misconfigured Kubernetes instance, in my case. And it, it is just sitting out there collecting data Ac and basically trying to find actively occurring threats. So usually there are, they, there are two categories of uh, honeypots, which are servers. So they emulate, either they emulate a server or they emulate a client. Today we are talking about server honeypots, which is the Kubernetes API server as well as the kubelet. So technically, the Kate spot is even comprised of two servers. And generally, you can say that there are multiple different interaction types. So you can have low interaction honeypots. And I'm, I'm taking SSH as, a comp uh, as, a, as an example, because I guess at this point, almost anyone in this room knows SSH. <laughs> so the idea is a low interaction honeypot is just giving you a username and password prompt and just logs that. So that's all it does. There are The next step would be medium interaction honeypots. These have some simulation. So you give it a username and password, it lets you in, and it lets you run some commands. It might look like you're, you're doing an, uh, an LS on root, but in, in practice, you're not really executing a command on a system, but instead you're just getting a string, basically a string answer from a honeypot. And the last and the biggest thing are full systems that are basically man in the middle proxy. These are real systems that you interact with, and these just log everything you do. So in that case, you could think, for example, of a Docker container that you SSH into. And you have a man-in-the-middle proxy that acts as your honeypot and decides whether you actually run that command or not. But it also logs every th single thing that you do. These are the hardest to detect. Speaking of it, so it is like an inverse pyramid. So if you look from low to high interaction honeypots, the detail and the inside grow with each layer. So low, low interaction honeypots, you get a username and password, and that's basically it. High interaction honeypots, you can even see what people are doing, what payloads they are trying to download and run. But with detail and inside, also the error potential and the attack surface increases because this, the honeypot itself as a system is getting more and more complex for you to run which also means it's more and more demanding on the hardware. I mean, for a low interaction honeypot, you can get away with the, with the Raspberry Pi 1, which is what I actually started with. Um, running a full-fledged full Kubernetes on that is going to be hard. <laughs> 
So coming back to the Kate's pot, this is a medium interaction honeypot at this point. So what I'm doing is I'm not running a real Kubernetes, but what I did was I, I, I started a cluster and then pulled all the JSON APIs and basically all the responses. So now I'm re kind of replaying or redelivering API responses from a Kubernetes cluster, which is pretty convenient, especially from a liability perspective, because whatever an attacker tries at least, it won't run on your real Kubernetes cluster. So you're not sacrificing a cluster or anything. That said, keep in mind, even honeypots are software, even honeypots are exploitable. So also there, you might get code execution on a honeypot, which is also something I've seen happening. So keep that in mind when you, when you want to deploy something like that. So again, let me maybe summarize a little bit. The Katespot is a medium interaction honeypot. It is written in Go because Kubernetes itself is written in Go. And I'm trying to build something that looks like Kubernetes. And that is most easy if you stick to the same language because you can run the same gRPC servers and basically mimic as much as possible the original uh, Kubernetes interfaces. So it even interacts with kubectl. So if you point your kubectl in your kubectl to my honeypod, it will just show you the running pods and nodes. And that is what I wanted it to do, right? So you want it to look like a real thing. And what I'm currently collecting is mainly user agents, all API calls, and command, uh, container command execution and creation. So should anyone try to try to actually run anything container-wise on these honeypots? I will log that. I will see that. So that's all cool and well, but how does that look like? So I have actually prepared something, which is, let me see if I can, yeah, OK. So what you can see here is the honeypot itself, which is so basically it's for now what you can see is when I point my kubectl at it, which is exactly what I just explained, which is wait, there it is. Let me just increase distance size a little bit. So you give it, basically, this is a little weird witness with my kubectl config. I don't remember why it did that. But as you can see, it is a kubectl get pods. And it, would, it basically gives you the same command output that a real cluster would, which also means I can get the nodes, which will tell me, oh, which will tell me that it is a mini cube which is the one thing to do, which is kubectl. But there are also offensive security tools, which are, for example, the kubelet control, which is specifically tailored towards exploiting exposed kubelets. And even that one, I can basically run. And obviously, it gives me no output at this point, because I didn't configure it to do so. But the thing is, the command returns. It gives me all the pods. So wait. So basically, I see all the pods that are running. I see all the things that are happening. And on the honeypot itself, I expected it. <laughs> I think I have a little problem with my demo gods, because it looks like I, my LNAV isn't uh, my, my, OK, so technically, what you should have seen there should have been um, actually JSON logs, which I will hand in, which I have handily prepared a screenshot for you because it wasn't working as ex intended. So the problem with that is you now have like thousands or hundred thousands of line of JSON. That's all good and well, but that's nothing that a human actually wants to sift through, right? So not even that. 
you have an IP address, you have the API endpoint, what do you do with it? So what I do with it is I take it and put it into a Splunk dashboard. But you, at this point, you have JSON log. So whatever you use as a log visualizer, if you want to use Sumo or the Elk stack, you're free to use whatever you want. I chose Splunk because I have historical ties to the product, and I know it a little bit. So looking at that, you can see that basically uh, this is the kubelet. So basically the thing that looks like it is running on a node. And what this gives me is a rough idea of what traffic I see, what happens on the pods themselves, and also what user ag ag agents I see. This is not that bad, but the thing is, on the big Kubernetes server, I'm seeing, so on the big Kube API um, honeypot, I see a lot of m traffic. But the interesting thing about that is, it's not all Kubernetes traffic. As it is HTTPS exposed, we actually see a lot of general exploitation traffic. So entering that, uh, let me actually talk a little bit more about the general, uh, the general learnings and the general things that, we, that I see each day on these honeypots. So I can tell you now that for the data and learnings is I had a look at the last 60 days of uh, traffic. So I've been running them for longer, but in the interest of, uh, of having most up-to-date data, I was only looking at the last 60 days. So mostly what, I, what we see is, or what I saw is, opportunistic data collection. So read-only mode, things like what pods are running, what version is it, what is happening. There was an occasional delete request, so I saw multiple tries of people actually deleting the Kube API controller or the ingress and out egress configurations. But the rest was web exploits, OWA, Spring Framework Exploitation, <laughs> Crypto Mining, so it is, and also botnets. So this is something that we see, we've seen for years and years, especially on SSH, for example. We've seen a lot of active exploitation or, or of, of ex active distribution of crypto mining and botnets. So this is nothing new. I guess uh, this is something that most people here know already. So. The question is, why did I see so few attacks that are specifically tailored towards Kubernetes? So I actually had a talk with a lot of people already at the conference, and these are some ideas that we came up with. So the problem is, first of all, I'm, I, I, I built the whole honeypot, or at least the API requests that I'm currently use around a minikube. So it's, it's like a small little Kubernetes instance used for edge computing, and it's not one of the big, large-scale deployments. So it's no GKE, it's no Azure cluster, um, which also means it is, it is also hosted on a small German hoster. And that also means it has, if, if people are targeting the room of the, the, the IP address room of cloud providers, they will likely won't find my infrastructure there. And also, there are no real payloads running on it. So the idea was, I have a cluster. I, d I just configured it. I expose it to the internet and come back later to it. And you never come back to it. That was the original idea of the honeypot. I'm still working on changing that up a little bit to make it a little bit more of a juicy target. But right now, the configuration isn't changing which also means maybe, you, maybe an attacker doesn't want to burn his fancy containers or his fancy tooling on such a small, uninteresting target. And last but not least, Kubernetes is a very complex platform. So I would argue that 
people are more interested in low-hanging fruits. So if you expose a Docker socket on the internet, for example, things are complete, looking completely different. There's quite a lot of people doing funny things with exposed Docker sockets, but Kubernetes, so far, at least as what, from what I've seen, I would, I would argue that many people are not jumping on that train yet because it's simply too complex. So, again, it, is, it has a lot of specific attack surface, not in terms of actual software flaws, but most of it is configuration because Kubernetes gives you a million switches and knobs you can turn, and usually for anything you want to do with it, there is the vanilla way, so the, 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 the way of original Kubernetes, and then there is the whole CNCF ecosystem of usually five to ten alternatives that you can use that do some things better or different than the vanilla one. So it is actually a platform with lots of unique challenges and lots of moving parts. So what do you do about it? It is especially the question of increased operational complexity. So it is a highly distributed and ephemeral uh, product or platform, which means you're, you, you, don't, you, you usually don't update or change your, your containers or your infrastructure. If you want to change something, you throw it away and you build it up in a new way. So what I'm showing you is a little bit of a culmination of best practices and learnings that I had, that I've picked up at work, as well as from the honeypots. And also, there is uh, a lot of very good documentation. For example, the OWASP Kubernetes Cheat Sheet is uh, an extremely valuable resource if you, want to if you want to look at some best practices. So I guess the most interesting topic for people is updates, because Kubernetes is basically releasing three times a year, which means you need to stay on top. Most of the cloud providers don't provide you that many legacy versions. So if you run on release, if you run basically not the current release, it will happen sooner or later that they force you to upgrade your cluster. So this is something you need to be aware of. And I guess, at least in discussions with customers, I've seen it happen quite a bit, that people are a little bit uh, it, it, is, it is a hard change for many people because this doesn't play well with, um, I would say, well-established development and upgrade cycles because you need to be quick. The other thing I saw is cloud metadata access. So you have your .aws paths, you have your .env paths in all of your cloud providers, and I've seen a lot of active requests to actually see if that was exposed. So if you have that, if that is available and mounted in your machines, in your infrastructure, make sure it's not publicly available. And finally, again, OWASP, Sys, NIST, Metro. So there are a lot of frameworks that can help you and give you a little bit of guidance. I know these are quite big and complex as well. So this is one of the reasons I'm here, so to give you at least some pointers as to where you could start. So regarding configuration, there is also something I've seen a lot of people a little bit shy away from, which is RBAC, which is, is role-based access control. So it is, the idea is it gives you granular permissions on a resource level from single namespaces to cluster-wide or even all namespaces on it. And honestly, use it. It, is, it might be complex, but this is what, what is, is, is basically, <laughs> I wouldn't consider it a low-hanging fruit, but the thing is, if you do it right, you have a lot of use cases and attacks that simply are impossible because people aren't allowed to do them. So that's one thing. The next thing is closed ports. That's, I guess that's a classic that uh, <laughs> most IT security folks should, should and will know by now. So for example, the kubelet. This is what runs the pods themselves on a node. You can expose that to the internet, which is basically the same as exposing a Docker socket to the internet. Anyone can just run their stuff on it. 
So maybe don't expose it, or if you have to expose it, at least make sure you have authorization on that. General practice as well, Kubernetes has audit logging. So how about enabling audit logging and then use a CM, like Splunk or any other CM that you have to your that you have available. And finally, there is a thing that is called a pod security, a pod security admission, and it's deprecated little sister, which are pod security policies. And this is already what I meant with uh, a lot of updates. So when I start, started writing that talk, pod security policies were actually the thing. And pod security admission wasn't even there. So nowadays, it's just the other way around. Pod security policies are deprecated. So you need to, that's one of the problems that you have with Kubernetes. You need to be a little bit on the, you, you should skim, at, le at least skim the, uh, the release notes, because things are changing quite quickly. So talking about the pod security admission, and the pod security policies, what they do is basically they allow you to define what a Docker container or what a pod is allowed and isn't allowed to do. So for example, is it allowed to open a port? Is it allowed to mount host paths or PIDs? Or is it allowed to run as, a, is it allowed to run as an elevated user, so run as root? These are things that you can basically disallow or forbid with these two things. And then the final thing for your workloads themselves, so what you run on Kubernetes. There the question is, you have, again, the topic of network policies and admission controllers. So this is more like the runtime of Kubernetes itself, whereas everything before was more like configuration general system. So network policies, I guess, best known to, to networking folks is this is basically your firewall configuration. So you can tell Kubernetes, or you can decide on a workload or even pod basis who is allowed to talk to what and on which ports. And it is, it is the thing. Use it. Make good use of it. I would even recommend use that over, for example, se segmenting your network or introducing any kind of external firewall Try running first, at least for internal traffic in, inside the clusters. Try running with network policies. They're, like, they're there for a reason. They're good, good enough for most things that you want to do. The other thing that you, that you can do is using admission controllers. What admission controllers do is they intercept API calls. So anything you do with your cluster, any interaction that you have with the cluster, they can decide whether this is allowed or not. Which means, are you allowed to deploy this image? Are you allowed to deploy this image in a specific namespace? Yes or no? So this is something that may be disruptive, introducing into running clusters. But especially if you build a new one from the ground up, think about what people can do. What, and basically, you can combine this with RBAC and have a pretty good overview of what people are allowed to do and what not. And also, the, the, the whole th uh, thing of supply chain security, you signed images. There are automated image scanners that you can use that you basically can. And also, there is, you can enforce, e you can even enforce the use of signed images if you choose so. And finally, network, uh, you have uh, namespaces. So namespaces, they don't really, so, so they are a core concept of Kubernetes, and usually they, you can use them to at least separate your workloads to an extent. There, it, it is a little bit more complex than that, but the thing is that namespace, you, can even def, you can usually define your security on a namespace basis. So this is something that is quite nice and that you should do because, yes, it is not perfect, but at least you have a start. And you can also use RBAC and network policies on, an, on a basis for that. So, so you can be basically lock down one namespace and have another end namespace, a little bit easy. So as I've probably borrowed every last one of you by now, <laughs> let's do a bonus round of fun things I found in the pods. Because configuration, security, important, but we're also here for a little bit of fun. So, 
what this is, is a Tomcat bypass. So again, as I said, this is running on uh, on a box standard HTTPS port. So I see a lot of traffic that is happening that is not necessarily Kubernetes specific. So obviously, thankfully, a Tomcat bypass doesn't impact me. But it's also something that might be happening. So if you choose to expose your Kubernetes instance to the internet, also keep in mind that you see a lot of other traffic that might even impact you, depending on how robust your ingest is. Then, of course, I've seen the big scanners. So be it Shodan, be it Palo Alto, Census, I even saw Baidu stopping by and collecting some, I would say, yeah, ba basically everyone looked a little bit at the endpoints, at the pods, what I have. But also, I saw some interesting thing, which is uh, GDN Plus. I have actually never heard of them, and I saw that they do that they had a user. Also, bear in mind these are user agents, so I wouldn't trust them as far as I can throw them. But still, the interesting thing is if you have GDN Plus or if you have your company name in your user agent, of course I'm going to look at your homepage. And GDN Plus, uh, if you folks are interested in, or if anyone knows them, please let me know, because I looked at their website, I have still no idea what they do. So technically they say gather, analyze, provide. They say something about internet-wide scanning services, but they basically have no offerings as to what they do. So. If it's a front to something, also let me know, because I would be really interested as to what. <laughs> Speaking of general traffic, I was a little bit surprised. So this is, again, uh, the, this is the ASN distribution, so every traffic that I've seen over the last months. What didn't surprise me was that I saw a third of the traffic from DigitalOcean. That is something that has been ongoing for years, because DigitalOcean, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to give out platform credit if you, if you, um, add, if you sign up with a credit card. So basically, they give you free, free platform credit to play around with. What surprised me really, though, were, were two things, which is Microsoft. So I saw a lot of traffic from Microsoft ASNs. And the last thing, fun fact, I used to see a lot of OVH traffic. So OVH also was, ha or in some circles, they were notorious for ignoring takedown requests and basically abuse. <laughs> and OVH traffic basically dropped to next to nothing since the data center burned down in France. <laughs> so kind of interesting to see. So to give you a little bit more detail, what I saw is, I mean, Again, the, these ASN resolutions, I, I wouldn't take them for granted. It's, it's just the last hop of traffic where it came from. So I, is, I was not so much uh, surprised to see a lot of traffic from AS202984. I'm not going to try. I'm not going to bother and try to pronounce that, that folks' name, because I, I will slaughter it anyway. <laughs> so the thing is, this ASN, they've I've seen them for years and years on all of my honeypots, so be it SSH, Telnet, SMTP. So this is nothing Kubernetes specific, but it's still interesting because it, he was only, or this ASN only uh, connected to my Kubernetes API. It did not, in fact, touch the mini cube, uh, the, the, the kubelet. So this is something that was kind of interesting to me, and I'm still trying to figure out why that is. So speaking of the kubelet, I saw a surprising amount from, uh, of traffic from, from uh, Prague, from Czechia, which is also something I didn't expect and didn't see before. Because maybe as a little bit of a context, I've been running honeypots for, I think, six or seven years now. So I have a pretty good feeling for usual ASNs or usual traffic sources that I see. So this kind of surprised me. So if any one of you knows a little bit more or can provide me a little bit of insight about these ASNs or, no, or recognizes anything, please feel free to flag me down after the talk. I'd be super interested to talk a little bit about it. And to close that up with some key takeaways for you. So if you see something, say something. 
which is please do the usual dance of monitoring, logging, and inventory. So basically, you should know what is on fire and if that belongs to you. So if something runs in your cluster, you better know who to flag down and who to kick, whose shin to kick to stop it from burning, hopefully. And also, you, might, you should hopefully be aware of is that stuff that is running in your cluster even your own? Or is that someone else's that just stopped by and dropped a container? So also, I, I, I really wanted to nail down this point, which is please try to use the native things first. So Kubernetes has a lot of stuff that it already ships which is one of the problems, because it ships with a lot of stuff. <laughs> so the idea is try network policies before you introduce big proxies. Try, role -based, try rolling out role-based access control. And also, there is a lot of tools out there, many of them even open source, that can help you and that can actually point out some best practices or even introduce new functionality that you might like. But before you try them, or even a commercial product, maybe think about looking at the native things first that Kubernetes has to provide. And speaking of paid services, <laughs> we, we heard in the last talk a little bit about the idea of, of managed services or basically letting other people build stuff for you. But still, I would argue, maybe evaluate if managed services might be a thing for you, because especially as Kubernetes has quite a lot of moving parts, managed services typically run on best practices and recommendations. And as Kubernetes has a lot of surface, you usually need quite a bit of engineering power to really make it secure and keep it secure. So maybe keep in mind monitoring, inventory, logging, and have a look at the native capabilities that Kubernetes has. And with that, you can find the Honeypot itself, the Splunk dashboards, as well as the slides over at the GitHub repository. Feel free to scan the QR code if you want to. <laughs> Hopefully, you have a link preview uh, as, a, as a little security exercise. But for any further questions, please feel free to chat me up after the conference or ask them now. <laughs> Right. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Someone? Yes, two one. Just one second. So you mentioned in your talk that you have the assumption that uh, some of the attackers didn't drop by because you were not hosting your honeypot uh, on one of the big uh, clusters like AKS or whatever. Is uh, this plan for the future, or do you think you'll run in trouble if you, for example, host your honeypot of an Azure cluster? So the thing is, technically, I don't need a cluster to run my honeypot. So Benjamin, the, the guy that is doing the next talk, by the way, stick, by, uh, stick over here, because he's doing another take on this. Uh, this is going to be interesting. Uh, so he, also, he already recommended, basically, how about building that as a, as a Lambda function and try to run it. Because the thing is, I don't need to, I know, basically that thing runs on a potato. So it's, it's compiled Go code, so it's super lightweight. The thing is, hopefully I don't get in trouble. I will try to deploy it on some cloud infrastructure to have at least the IP range. Honestly, I have, now that you mention it, I've never actually investigated whether the, um, whether the, the uh, Kubernetes specific, if whether there are Kubernetes specific uh, IP ranges that are in the cloud providers, I. But that's that's actually a good idea. So, long story short, yes, it's planned. Um, it's also planned to basically switch it up a little bit and not make it look like a mini cube, but maybe instead like a big cluster, like a big production cluster. That might be more of an interesting target. Hi. 
Um, I just have the question if you are collaborating with others or if you're accepting data from others or do you have any plans to do so? So if that even makes sense. I'm, so I'm, if others deploy their honeypots and just share data that they get? The problem of, with me, if, for me is I don't know how to aggregate this data from external sources, but I would be very interested if anyone wants to run this honeypot or anything else, feel free to tag me down because it's super interesting for me. I would love to get more insights. I mean, I know that the honeypot community is rather small, but it is still something that I would everyone recommend to at least try because it's really fun to see what's happening to your infrastructure. So if anyone wants to share their data and, or wants to run their own, please feel free to contact me through GitHub, Twitter, or whatever. I'm happy to help, I'm happy to collect, and I'm happy to share. All right, thank you very much. If you want to chat with him, he will be around uh, the whole conference and will be happy to share his experience. Uh, with you, of course. So thank you again uh, for your presentation, and then uh, we... So.